Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. For the last several weeks, we've been exploring the Acts of the Apostles, the continuing adventures of Jesus' earliest followers. And Acts is really an extension of the Gospel of Luke, written by the same author, with one remarkable difference. Jesus is no longer there. Acts picks up right where Luke leaves off with Jesus ascending into heaven and the apostles standing around, staring up into the sky, looking at each other blankly and asking, now what? The Acts of the Apostles is all about the now what? And as folks who live on the post-Constantinian side of Christian history, I think it's hard for us to understand just how confusing and risky and unpredictable the early years were for Jesus' disciples. There was no rule book for how to spread the gospel or establish a church. There was no strategy for how to navigate the religious politics of the synagogue or the imperial politics of Rome. The road was filled with pitfalls and detours and obstacles. All they really had was the passion that burned in them on Pentecost, the conviction that a new way of life was possible, and each other. For those earliest Christians, the way of Jesus was a hand-to-hand -hand faith. There were no doctrines or creeds. There weren't even written versions of the Gospels yet. The faith didn't live in their heads, but in their hearts and in their lives. What you said to people mattered much less than what you did for them. But what you did could get you in a lot of trouble. We certainly see this in the scripture reading that Heather just shared for us. Our hero this morning is the Apostle Paul, the controversial convert who encounters the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And in one powerful, mystical moment, Paul goes from killing the followers of Jesus to becoming their strongest advocate. And ever since then, Paul and his friends have been traveling through the Greek and Roman world, sharing the gospel and baptizing new followers and establishing churches. And one day, as they are wending their way through the city of Philippi, they are trailed by a slave girl, a psychic, whose gift of fortune-telling earns her masters a good deal of money. For days she follows them, shouting that Paul and Silas work for the Most High God and that they hold the real keys to salvation. Now, one might think that this was great publicity. One might think that Paul was impressed that she saw the truth of who they were. One might think Paul was moved by her plight, but one would be wrong. For Paul is clearly not impressed or concerned, but is actually rather annoyed. So he turns and he commands the spirit demon to leave her. But this angers her masters because they made a lot of money on that demon. And so they drag Paul and Silas in front of a kangaroo court where they are accused of disturbing the peace and they're thrown into the deepest recesses of the jail. Okay. To be honest, I find this whole episode kind of confusing. Thank you. <laughs> On the one hand, Paul liberates this girl from a demon that made her a commodity to her masters. On the other hand, he doesn't seem motivated by compassion, but by frustration. She is irritating him, and he wants her to shut up. Was he being merciful? Or was he being really kind of a jerk? Paul is a tricky guy. He wrestles unabashedly with competing forces within himself. As he writes in one of his letters, I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Theologians have had a field day with what Paul meant by that. But throughout his letters, he seems to speak out of both side of his, sides of his mouth, whether it's on the spiritual equality of women, the liberation of slaves, or the authority of the government. In his letters to the Romans, he condemns same-gender sexuality. Yet in his letter to the Corinthians, he waxes eloquently on love. And ironically, the never-married guy who recommends celibacy for everyone is most often quoted at weddings. 
It's a very challenging sermon to preach, my friends, let me tell you. But to put it simply, Paul is a paradox. But that may be why he is so compelling to us, especially as modern Christians. Because living with paradox is the name of the game. We are all called to hold competing truths in tension with each other. As Richard Rohr said in our modern lesson, I'm convinced that is the very meaning of faith. Faith is agreeing to live without full resolution. Both the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures make that very clear. Rohr says, we are often called to walk in darkness where God leads us to that next step, which is usually not clear, predictable, or controllable by the rational mind. And he quotes Thomas Merton who says, I've become convinced that the very contradictions in my life are in some way signs of God's mercy to me, if only because someone so complicated and so prone to confusion and self-defeat could hardly survive for long without special mercy. I think we can all relate to that. So sitting in the darkness of that jail cell, Paul is certainly living without full resolution. And he's certainly no stranger to the contradictions and confusions and self-defeats that our actions can bring. I mean, once his faith compelled him to persecute Christians, and now it inspires him to serve them. Even as he embraces a gospel of liberation and love, he finds himself imprisoned and hated. His life used to make sense. As a devout Pharisee, he knew the law and he lived by it. And out of his love for God, he enforced it zealously, even, that meant, even if that meant condemning and persecuting others. But now his experiences of faith were different. They were not quite so clear and rational and predictable. They were far more paradoxical. Having experienced the overwhelming light of Christ, he now knows that God is often found in the darkness, even the darkness of a jail cell, where we don't know what happens next, when we are tempted to doubt and feel defeated. And so I believe in that solitary cell, Paul knew he could only survive with God's special mercy. Mercy is a powerful agent. If faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, I think the same holds for mercy. And this is what makes the rest of the story, that second part, so miraculous. And it's not the sudden earthquake that shatters the prison's walls, and it's not the breaking of the chains that sets free Paul and the other prisoners, but it's what comes next. For fearing that he's going to be blamed for the prison break, the jailer decides to take his own life. But Paul does not let that happen. He and Silas could have escaped, but they remain so that the jailer will not get in trouble. And what's even more remarkable is that all the other prisoners do the same. Nobody leaves. Instead, they choose to show mercy to the man and risk their own freedom. Now, the jailer is dumbfounded, and he collapses in front of Paul and Silas. Who are you people, he asks. And why have you done this? And how can I learn to live like you? Paul's unexpected act of mercy towards this man does more than any words could do, than any catechism or creed could do. It turns the predictable notions of how the world works and how human beings behave upside down. It demonstrates God's outrageous compassion in a visceral and life-changing way. For there are few things more powerful than grace that catches us unprepared. It causes us to rethink what we thought we knew about the inevitability of the human condition. And it gives us hope. I think of the families of those 10 Amish girls years ago who were shot in their school. And those families went to the home of the killer's widow, bringing her food and offering their comfort to her in her grief. And I think of the families of the nine members of Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston who faced the racist gunman in court and through tears of their grief offered him forgiveness. Acts like this reveal to us a reality of grace that had seemed previously unattainable. If radical mercy is real, if grace is true, then there is hope for all of us. 
On Thursday evening here in this very space, we were honored to host the townwide service of Yom HaShoah, the day of remembrance of the Holocaust. Our guest speaker was an 87-year-old survivor named Fred Heyman. Fred was a young teenager in Berlin when the Nazis were in power, and his early years were marked by the terror and insecurity of that brutal regime. He told us a story about a night when the Gestapo came to his house. His father had been arrested and was being kept in a government building awaiting possible deportation to one of the camps. They didn't know whether he would go or stay. And he and his mother were at home when a knock came on the door. His mother told Fred to get into bed and hide, for the Gestapo agents had come to arrest him. So stalling for time, Fred's mother told the officers that her son was in bed with a fever. And the two men walked into the bedroom and they found Fred under the covers. And one of the officers placed his hand on Fred's cool and healthy forehead and said to his partner, we have to come back later. This boy has a fever. He's too sick to go with us. That Gestapo officer had a choice to follow the orders he was given or to show mercy to the boy under the covers. He chose to show mercy. As Fred told the story, I wondered what was going inside the heart and mind of that officer. I mean, he was just one man, right, caught in an awful system. Was this a momentary act of grace or one of millions of small, dangerous kindnesses that he showed while also playing his part in a heartless regime? What sort of paradox was he wrestling with? We don't know. But his choice to be merciful changed Fred's life, and Fred never saw it coming. He also never forgot it. He told us that having survived, his mission is not to tell the stories of the six million Jews lost in the Holocaust, but to tell his story six million times to honor their memory. He called this man and all those who risked their lives by acting courageously and compassionately, he called them upstanders. Each of us, he said, can choose to be an upstander too. This is the kind of hand-to-hand -hand and heart-to-heart -heart faith that we have been entrusted with. The choice is always ours. Even in the midst of our own confused and imperfect and paradoxical lies, even when we, like Paul, don't understand our own actions and more often than not do the thing we don't want to do, we can be agents of God's unexpected mercy in the lives of those around us. We can choose that. A little bit of grace can lead to big miracles. May we allow the contradictions of our lives to be the space where we discover God's mercy. And may we then be inspired to share that mercy with others. For you never know whose life you will change. May it be so. Amen.